All right, all right. You have come back. <laughs> all right, let's take our confession this morning. One to go. Confession. I say to, listen to the word of God today. The door of utterance has been opened unto me, and I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me. This is the way to go, walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the Spirit of God, and I'm not distracted by anything or anyone. The Word of God is food to my spirit. I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It is oil to my face, causing my life to shine, giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things to me. He also brings to my remembrance things Jesus once showed me. I came to understand the system on the earth, and I receive instruction, encouragement, correction, and the enablement to live out God's will. Amen. Excuse me. Can you help me bring that? No, no. He would, the, the tower, the, take off the glass. I want you to find the illustration and the sweet. Then bring the cup. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I want to use it to illustrate something. All right. Uh, this morning, we, um, I want to look at something um, significant, I believe, in the scriptures, but it's in line with what we have been uh, teaching, but in a very unique way. Now, if we go to Psalm 106, verse 13 to verse 17. Uh, we've been using this scripture. It says, they soon forgot his works and waited not for his counsel. It says, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Then he gave them their own request or their request, but sent a lameness to their souls. And then the Bible says they envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron there. So we're looking at the subject of the fact that uh, the nation of Israel at that critical moment prayed wrongly to God. What they simply did was to offer a prayer according to what they felt was best for them in that situation, and the Bible calls it, it came from lost, and we'll look at that. And this one, I want to look at lost or covetousness, all right, as against the grace of God provided in Christ Jesus. So they asked that way. And we've seen that prayer is designed by God to receive what heaven has provided for any and every situation in our lives. Let me repeat it. Prayer is receiving what heaven has provided and designed and provided for our own situation. That is, when Jesus defined prayer, he said, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So it already is in heaven is that his will will be done as it already exists in heaven. So prayer is not to inform God about what he should do concerning a situation, but to receive what heaven wills concerning that particular thing. And so in prayer, we are submitting really to the will of heaven on the earth. In other words, we are submitting ourselves that what heaven or God has planned, let it be done in this particular situation. 
and we must recognize that the heavens doth rule. In other words, in Daniel chapter 4, verse 25 and verse 26. All right. So they told Daniel this, and this is how Daniel lost his kingdom, sorry, Nebuchadnezzar, and was thrown into the wilderness. It says, they shall drive thee from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall, they shall make thee eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven years will pass over thee until... Thou knowest that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and he giveth it to whomsoever he wills. Next verse. Whereas they left the commanded to leave the stump of the tree root, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after you have known that the heavens doth rule. Now, one of the reasons is that even Christians, born-again Christians, have not they paid lip service to lordship, but they haven't accepted it as an integral part of their lives. That is, your own kingdom, your position on this earth, your rulership on this earth means reigning in life as a king on this earth, dominating there, will be established once you recognize that the heavens doth rule. And so what you are looking up to God for is not, well, this word I think, and we're going to look at this this morning, that God is the best option I think you should do here, but that you have something that heaven has willed and have come in prayer to receive it. We've explained that prayer all right, is not to cause God to give something, is to cause us to receive what God has already given. So if I enter into prayer about a situation, I'm entering to receive what God has already given me in that particular place. So I acknowledge my, the receipt of that thing with thanksgiving. All right, acknowledging, Father, you've done it for me in this situation, and therefore I've come in prayer to receive it. So the work in prayer is not being done on God. That's to make God do something. The work in prayer is being done in and on you to cause you to receive what God has done. Because the starting point, is that we don't even, even Jesus, when he got into prayer, the Bible says, it talks about just saying, look, let not, it says, can this cup pass over? He says, but not my will, let thy will be done. So there's a reluctance at the beginning can be in a person to even align yourself with the will of God. And so God is at work in us as we pray, both for us to will and then to now do of his own good Pleasure. In other words, the willingness, first of all, to see his will. Now to see it and we now get excited. Oh, this is what God really wants. I didn't know. And then for the performance of that particular thing. So in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11, it tells us, Ephesians 1, 11, it tells us how God works. All right. In whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Or put it in the Amplified Version. The Amplified that has C classified. All right? In whom, in him, we also are made, were made God's heritage portion, and we obtained an inheritance, for we had been foreordained, chosen, appointed beforehand, in accordance with his purpose who works out everything in agreement with the counsel and design of his own will. So when they waited not for the counsel of God, they weren't waiting for the will of God in that particular situation, 
what they did was that they made their own request known unto God as they felt what God should do. Now, we've said if you insist on that, and you are not asking God to commit transgression. In other words, when they were asking for meat, it wasn't God to commit transgression. They were simply saying, this is what we want. Are you not asking God to dispossess somebody of something so you can have it, which is covetousness there? Then God can release that particular thing to you in the condition that, look, this thing is not going to bring satisfaction to your soul. So they had leanness in their soul. That's why you can understand the depth where John was coming from. I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. You have to be in the center of God's will. Because you can have cars and houses, but your soul can be lean. That's what, that's what he's teaching there. So prosperity is not just an external thing. He says, as your soul prospers, which means it is something that happens first in the soul of that person. So it's not just that, God, I come to you. This is the first point we need to get. Well, this is what I think you should do about him. Showing where we have problems. And I'm asking you, you must do this here. And if you press, God says, all right, we'll give it to the person. They gave it to the person. Gave it to them. Uh, they found leanness inside their soul. Uh, we find it also, it, we'll see this, in the nation of Israel when they prayed. So in prayer, the work being done is not in God. It's not that you are trying to persuade God by your persistence in prayer. The persistence in prayer is a transformation that is going on as you are praying in the spirit. The Holy Ghost is doing a work inside you to bring you into the knowledge of God's will, to bring you into alignment with God's will, which is what he calls righteousness, so that you are in, in sync with God and then the power of God can now move within your life. So we've explained this. Now, this is the base of prayer. God has already provided all things in Christ Jesus. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, it tells us that I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. In other words, the gospel, which means good news, that's the meaning of what gospel, is the good news, the gospel is a message about the grace of of Christ. So there is grace that Jesus brought. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. And the good news is the good news of the grace of Christ that is available to you in any situation. Someone defined it, and it's an accurate definition, as grace, that's G-R-A-C-E, as God's riches at Christ's expense. In other words, the grace of Christ is that Jesus died on the cross and paid the price that God's riches might be made available unto us through him. So it says the gospel is God's, all right, the grace of Jesus. That's why when Paul was praying, let this thing depart. God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Go, come up to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Knowing this, that what I'm going for is what God has already provided in Christ Jesus. Galatians 5 and verse 1 says, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. You can't, with the liberty that Christ has made us free, stand in that and don't get entangled in the yoke of bondage. So there is a liberty that we already have in Christ, freedom. He says, stand in that particular thing. Stand in the fact that the provision has already been made in Christ. And so I come in prayer, and if I'm standing there, I'm thanking God. That's my approach. Father, I thank you for what you have willed to do in this situation that exceeds in abundant measure anything that I can ask or imagine. I now position myself in prayer according to your word to receive everything that you have provided in this particular situation. That's the starting point. 
And at some point in prayer, this is what I want to say, you receive illumination to know exactly what God wants to do as the answer to your prayer. And once that illumination comes, faith comes. There is no struggle that is involved in believing God that it will happen. Faith enters into your heart, and with faith, you don't have prophetic power, which means you come out of that place of prayer and say, it is done. And you come out and say, by this time, this thing is going to be done because you have seen it there. That's what Jesus was saying. He said, I do nothing except I see my father do. So you are in the place of prayer until revelation comes. Once revelation comes, they come out. That's what the patriarchs used to say when they go to the mountain top. What they're going to the mountain top is not to persuade God. They separate themselves and a time comes in the depth of prayer. We'll see this, they get it. They say, we've seen what God wants to do. They come out of that place with confidence and audacity. And they say, clearly, look, this is what's going to happen. And it happens in that particular way. But it's not the idea they took to in prayer. When they were going in prayer, you ask them, what do you think? What they were thinking was one thing. What God revealed became another thing. And they came down with revelation. And that became all right. So let's look at Romans chapter 5. See, this weather is not. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are not smiling. Romans 5 and verse 8. Romans 5, 8. Here. Yeah. So I want to show this. Now God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. In other words, we didn't ask. This is grace now. Christ died for us. We didn't pray about it. God set it in motion by himself. Then it says in Romans 8, 32, if he did not spare his only son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Now, if he gave his only begotten son, the most precious, you understand that with him, he has freely given all things. So what, where's the problem? That's all I want to see here. So first thing we must understand is our faith is built on the love that the Father has for us, his goodness and his mercy. That's the foundation of our faith. Then on that is the ability of God to fulfill what he will reveal to us in his love that he has provided <coughs> for that particular situation there. All right? So God is saying, faith is you judge me according to my character. That is impossible for God who loves me and wants the best for me not to be thinking about me and to leave my soul in the pits of hell, so to speak. All right? That's why when they complain, God, you are forsaken. God says, you don't get it. It is impossible for me to forsake you. It's impossible for me to leave you. I have engraven you upon the palms of my hands. Your walls are continuously before me. All right? It says a woman may forget a sucking child or not have compassion on the son of her womb, but it's practically impossible for that to happen. So what, is it? what, what then is the reason? The problem is not on God's side. I'm saying we want to show this. It's really on our own side. And you see what the enemy is doing. All right? So he's saying, listen, if you respond to my love in that situation, if even when things appear, all right, not to be going right, and you acknowledge my love for you, you acknowledge that I'm not going to be deceived by these external things, but I acknowledge that God loves me, and I acknowledge his mercy over my life, and I thank him for that love. He said, you will begin to see changes. That's what Jonah was saying. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice with a voice of thanksgiving. I will acknowledge God's love. That's what Paul was saying. He said, we are more than conquerors through Christ or God that loves us in Christ Jesus. That there is nothing you want to throw at us. You can't separate us from the knowledge that God loves us. That's the victory. In other words, I acknowledge in the midst of a situation that brought absolute disappointment 
that God, you love me, you are kind towards me, you are merciful towards me, and God says, once you start acknowledging that, I don't allow things on the other side, can God have done this? How could God have done this? And all of that. Then just wait. I will walk all things after the cancel of my will. When I finish my work and you see my counsel made manifest, that you will know that it was utterly sinful for you to have ever murmured about anything in life. That let me produce it after. You think, I mean, you don't know the way to where God is taking you. You are a human being. You are not God. If you want to understand it, just put a, an ant in a maze here. And then the ant is running around trying to find the way. That's how life is. We are like tiny ants there in a massive maze of life. And we are running around the whole place and God is trying to show us the way to all those things that he has prepared for us. And, you know, we see his hand, we run away from his hand. Just like their ants will run away, all right, if a person puts their hand and thinks that you want to kill them, they want to destroy me, that's why they are coming, they are greater than me. And we have that kind of mindset and we are missing out on God's best, all right, for the situation within our lives there. So God wants to... Right, pour forth his love into our uh, lives. Now, what causes this gap? What's the gap there for? If God, who is also powerful, and he has made all the riches available in Christ Jesus, and is so compassionate towards us, then please, what is causing the gap between the condition in lives of God's people and the reality that you are speaking about in Christ Jesus. Here is where the gap is. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 2, it tells us that, all right, who may have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. So we are ignorant about what God really wants to do so we are out of the way, all right, there. What do I mean by this? Paul in Romans chapter 10 was in prayer. And see why his prayer wasn't getting through. He says, Romans 10, 1. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record they have a zeal of God. And when I was coming to ministry, this was a scripture that was impressed upon me. I saw Christians have this. I said, God, people are zealous. They are serving you from their heart. They are truly serving you, right? And you look at people's lives and say, God, I, he says they have a zeal of God, right? And their hearts desire and prayer to God that they may be saved. They have a zeal of God. He says, but the problem is they lack knowledge. But it's not according to knowledge. Now look at what he says. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness or God's provision are going about to establish their own righteousness. In other words, God has made this is the problem, has made his provision there. But people are ignorant of the fact that in every situation, God has provided something. So what they do is that they go about to establish what they think is right in that situation. So you are praying something else and God says, goodness, I have provided this. What you are doing there is that you are praying something else. God says, wait, you don't get it. I have provided this. That's why the Holy Spirit has been given. He has been given so that you can come to know. We'll see this. The things that God has provided. This is what's the missing link. God said this is what I provided. But people are praying something else. God, I'm telling you. Alebalo. Oh, Lord. God, Lord. God, Lord. They are fasting on it. The fasting will be to hear God. Do you get what I'm saying here? The fasting there is that they've already decided the way they are going. And they are trying to say, God, nothing can stop this. God, not, God is saying, look. All right? It is, it's not even as hard as you've made it. You have overdone this thing. If you had spent three days in fasting in submission, you'd have heard me. 21 days fasting in rebellion is what, do you get what I'm saying here? Are you following what I'm saying here? And that's where the issue is. And let me show you that. That's the gap. That's what Satan is doing. And I want to show that that's what he's lost his doing here. So once Satan realizes that you're in a situation, he baits you out of God's will. In other words, once you're in a situation here, that's what temptation is. He just dangles something that is nice. So you make that your prayer point. Are you following what I'm saying here? God has already provided something. You lost a job. He says you're going into business and all of that. A friend just comes and says, no, I got a job here. He dang Satan dangles it. You, oh, yeah, you start praying for a job in this company. Start praying for a job in this company. You just start making back. Go and look for scriptures to cover your case. Abba, do you, are you following? I'm, no, I'm going somewhere. Look. Look how it says. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12 to verse 13. 
So he says, now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is of God, that we may know. That's, that's why the Holy Ghost. If to know is not important, he won't give you the spirit. Do you get what I'm saying? He says, what is the problem? He says, they've been ignorant of God's righteousness or his provision. He says, what is the weakness? He says, they, he says, yeah, may have compassion on the ignorant. That's the weakness there. And on them that are out. Which means, once you are ignorant, you are out of the way. The way you are going seems right to you, but the end thereof is death. Because of the ignorance. So the Spirit of God has been given that you may know those things, all right? Put it back up here. That you may know those things, 1 Corinthians 2, 12, all right, that are given freely to you of God. Then it says, verse 13, which things also we speak. In other words, once you know it, then you start speaking it. And it, can, it, it comes from the knowledge the Spirit of God gave you about that situation which is revelation knowledge, which is something you wouldn't know until you entered into prayer and then you saw it. All right? Look, let, let me say this here. I said this in Canada. Let me say it here. Look, when I had no idea, I mean, I've said this, March 24th was the day Bishop Edipo did in his ministry. September 7th was the day we did uh, anniversary. Now, the reason is I've never done anniversary before in this church, but we should be doing anniversary never. Meal, okay? Same as we, but me, never done. So, I, I, one day I was in prayer, and I got deep into prayer, deep, and it just clicked that I do 30th anniversary and go and invite Bishop Edipo. In fact, it's one of the ministers that came. He said, I don't know what happened. He said, it's almost like Bishop Edipo's spirit woke up onto something. He said, there's something he woke up. Look, he called me the day before. He said, we have meetings on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday morning. He said, but you are heavy in this place. You are heavy. We are coming. He had meeting that morning, though. Huh? That he came. He says, we are coming. Listen, he said, the guy told me, he said, something woke up in his spirit. He said, I'm going for this. He just kept, he called him. He said, look, I'm coming to town. I'm, make sure you're there. I'm coming to town. He said something. I'm telling you that when you go by revelation, something happens. I said, I was praying. I entered by revelation. Let me tell you this. We had already planned. Why did I make it September? Because we had planned to do a minister's conference in September. And I'm going to invite ministers for the minister's conference. It was in prayer that I got 30th anniversary. You see that minister's conference I did? I wasn't in God's will. This is what I'm saying. No? The one that I connected again in prayer was the Lekki Believers Convention. So what was to happen actually was the Lekki Believers Convention and then in Saturday morning to do prayer. That morning one I did, that one, God did not send me. When I told someone, somebody said, hey, boy, I was blessed. I said, that's the problem. You think once you are blessed, you are in God's will like that. So I said, I gained something. I said, I can, I, can, I can say we're having a convention tomorrow now. I'm going to invite ministers. You gain something now. Are, are you following what I'm saying here? That's why, when, when I sat down, that's why if you listen to it, when Gideon Danso came, he said, ah, I didn't know this thing, leadership. I thought I came here for prayer. It's prayer I came to do. It's prayer I came. You know he said it? He said, Bosha, let me just talk this leadership. I knew how ah, this thing. All right? So the next day I told her, I said, don't bother coming again for leadership. Just pray in your hotel. Come in the evening. Come and do ministry in the evening. Because I knew that that one was permissible will. Do you get what I'm saying here? This other one was what? Perfect will. So when I got there and I was looking at things were going, they were not really the way I felt they would go. I wasn't disappointed because I knew. You see, when people are out, I say, oh God, I can't do this for me. I can't do ah, but I said, oh God, oh God, I applied for the visa. They didn't give me. Who sent you? Listen, do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> look, look let's, let's go here. So it says, which things we do what? We speak. Not with words that human wisdom teaches, but the Holy Spirit gives. Now look at Lamentation 3, 37 to 38. Lamentation 3. And I'm therefore I'm saying that it's in prayer you come to know these things. When you, are, you stay in prayer. All right. Lamentation 3, 37, 38. Who is he that saith and it cometh to pass when the Lord commandeth it not? All right. Verse 38 is verse 38 part of it. All right, out of my process. All right, so it says, Who is he that saith and it cometh to pass? 
which means for it to come to pass, you say it, is because the Lord has what? Commanded it first. So the first thing you do is you get in there and God shows you what he has. So what does Satan do? Satan therefore comes to bait us out of God's plan. In other words, this is God's plan here. He says, I will bait these people quickly. And this is where covetousness now comes in. What you do is that I will get something maybe that they can see in somebody else's life. And this is where people, you see, if you understand this, there will be no reason for you to be envious. We'll get into jealous about somebody else. Because we'll see this. What God has provided for you is only you. He provided that specific thing for you. If somebody else gets something, you will rejoice in it. What they get provokes you. You can see somebody with an inheritance and you know you are still naked. Do you get what I'm saying here? That, ah, for this person to be oppressed, that means that I should be at this kind of level here. Not that I should have what they have, but that I should move into my own space. Do you, are you following me? So you can have a businessman that meets with a preacher. The preacher is in the, is in the grace of his life. The businessman is in the grace of his life. That businessman will, I'm telling you, when he sits down with the preacher and they are talking, they will find out that it's even the same laws that are producing the same things for both of them. Because it was after he caught fish that he said, now you shall do what? Catch men. So he comes with that bait. And that's why Exodus 20 verse 17 in the law it tells us that thou shalt not covet. And so, so he comes there and thy neighbor's house, all right, or, or covet thy neighbor's wife or manservant or maidservant or ox or ass or anything that is your neighbor. That, that's how Satan tried to say, ah, this person has this. You also, I, I mean, I was listening to Kenneth Higgins recently and he said something. And this is what wrecked the faith message, all right? He said somebody was, you no know, name it and claim it. And I started doing that, feeling that, what faith is was that, well, they bring out a new Mercedes Benz. I want that Mercedes Benz now. Let me go and believe. That's not what it was. He said, look, they will send somebody. He even told him, he said, you know about this man? You know this minister? He said, he said, he saw him with his car, a Bronco or so. He said, I told him. He told him this, oh, to show covetousness. Oh. And the man thought he was in faith. He said, oh, I saw your Bronco, beautiful car. I've asked God for it, and he's told me he's giving me your car. So you can use it for a couple of times, but very soon it's going to be... <laughs> And the man believed he was speaking in faith. Do you understand this? To show deception there. That is to say that he saw something, his eyes entered. Do you get what I'm saying? James chapter 1 verse 13. It's the same thing. I mean, I mean it's a very profound, I think remember when he here, but a very profound statement. Like somebody caught it and put it, some of these um, blogs. So they put the, put that, very, I said this statement is very profound. She said, look, I said, this is it. She said, she was talking about people copying and all that. She now said, look, in her school, she will take time and she will pray and pray. In Abuja, pray, pray. And God will reveal to them what they should do in the school. And they'll put it into operation. And things begin to work. So she'll just see other schools. They'll just go and copy. Everybody just start copying, copying, copying. And she'll say, ah, can't you people get your own ideas from God? They'll just, everybody just be copying, copying. I know Nigerians are, are fantastic at that. That's why, let me tell you this. That's why some people, when they do things, they use money to raise it to a level that that you can't come to where they are. You just, you leave it. They, on purpose, so they will put money into the thing and put it up. They know that the people that have that kind of money will not, they, they are not copycats. But if you do it at a low level, everybody, all right, will just start doing it. So they put it at a high level. So yeah, put your hand up. Why that your job? You know that you can't do it. All right, so the point that she, she now made a statement. She said, she now said, in ministry, you see somebody, this is what she said, oh, who was in prayer, and God revealed to them to go and do something. They go and do it. You see the results of the revelation God gave them. Then you are believing God for it. Do you get what we're saying here? That's, they didn't go and believe God for it. They stayed in prayer. God revealed that go and do that particular thing. They went to do it. You got there. I'm telling you that when God reveals to you to do something, eh, inside your heart, you will know that, ah, this thing, I'm supposed to do it. Your mind might be shaking. That way will I get the finances? But once you start obeying, the thing will start working. 
Are you following what I'm saying there? Once you start doing it, things will start happening. Once you start obeying, things start happening. But if God did not reveal, you can now look at somebody else and say, ah, this person did this. Okay, right, so I'm going to do my own. Father, in the name of Jesus, let me go and look for the scriptures that guarantee that. that of course, you are looking for scriptures. You will find now. You, 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 you will look for the scriptures. You will take the scripture and turn it. Instead of you saying, ah, God, you did this massive thing. You mean in your presence there are things like this. Let me go to your own presence also that I may get what you have planned for me in my own life. Which is the order. All right, so James chapter 1. Bring this to a close. I want to show something. One more thing. James 1, 13 to 18. So he says, this is how people get tempted. Let no man say when I'm tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God can tempt no man with evil. Neither tempted he any man. He cannot be and he's not tempted. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. In other words, something entices you. Right? Satan dangles something that is good and you are enticed by that particular thing and then you reach for it. Look at the next verse there. It says, And when lust had conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Then it says, do not err, my beloved brethren. Which means, don't go into this error. Don't err into this thing. Don't let, all right, somebody dangle something before you and then, all right, you now err out of it. It says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Comes from the father of lights. The term father of lights means the father who gives it in the form of light. Which means... Don't let things on the outside. You say something, say, ah, that's what I too want. I say, ah, that's what I want. No. He says, don't err into that path there, right, of being sensual and carnal. Go to the Father. If, 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 the, the Bible says we provoke one another to good works. If, if people are doing stuff and, ah, say, and, and you are provoked, you feel that there's more to your life, then go to, to the Father of lights there and go and meet him, and he will give it to you in the form of light, which means he will illuminate your heart as to what he wants to do through you. Next verse there, he says, who hath begotten us with the word of his truth, which means it's from the word of God that light is going to come so that we should be a kind of first fruits of his own creatures there. All right? So when we see things that others, in the lives of others, yes, you are provoked. You don't get covetous there. All right, to seek God, to hear him on what he has for us. And so we enter into that. So here's the point I'm making here. There's a distinction for every person. Look at Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 to verse 9. What Paul said, Galatians 2, 7 to 9. He says, but contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of uncircumcision was committed to me, as the gospel of circumcision to Peter. Next verse, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision or to the Jews, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles, which means the might of God was in Peter towards the Jews, but the same might of God but his own was towards the Gentiles. Look at what he now said. The next verse, he now said, and when James, Cephas, and John still seem to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. So there is grace that is given to every single person. All right? Each person has a grace that is given to you. The grace that was given to Paul was a grace to reach the Gentiles. The grace that was given to Peter was a grace to reach the Jews. And I believe that's why when Peter came into the Gentile area, that grace was lifted up and he began to behave funny. When Paul also went to the Jews and they warned him that you are not supposed to, but he went there because Paul had an innate desire. And this is what Satan always plays with. He knows that somebody has an innate. You know, I heard Pastor Paul Elenche say something. All right? I've, I've heard Bishop, but I didn't hear the story complete. He said, Bishop Rodeco said this, when they ordained him to ministry, very strong stuff. He said, that's why you have to end time to pray to get it. He said, when he invited Pastor Adipo in 1983 to come and ordain him, he said his ministry was to start in Jaws. He sent his people, the party ahead to Jaws. They opened an office, everything, and they were ready. After the ordination, I go. He said, Pastor Adipo ordained him and left. 
After the ordination, God said, I never spoke to you to go to Joss. Stay back here in Lon. Ha! He said, but people have already gone to Joss. We've announced that that's where the ministry is what? Starting. Anybody that doesn't know that they are capable of making mistakes, you enter error. You see? He said, that we have already announced. I said, I didn't send you to Joss. You know what God said to him? God said, when you were 11 years old, this is what happened. You went on a holiday to Joss and you were playing table tennis. It was, didn't you remember, you said that day when you were 11, this is where I really want to settle. You know, the weather is nice in Joss, everything, that this is where I want to settle. He said, is that desire you had? That's why you stay in prayer to overcome those things. Or else, you will go with what you are programmed to go with. I've told you now, if I didn't come out and say that I miss God or ministers come, nobody will know in the world. If I went downstairs and somebody told me, I said, no, pastor, I was blessed. I said, boy, you don't understand. <laughs> I said, I can call meeting tomorrow. You'll be blessed. I can come and say this evening, my kiss is coming. You'll be blessed. If I say tomorrow, uh, so-so is coming, you'll be blessed. But will you be transformed? No, you'll just be what? Blessed. Yes. Are you following what I'm saying? So let me bring this to a close here. So there is grace that was given to him. Look at what Paul said. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2 to verse 3 here. Ephesians 3, 2 to 3. He now says it again. He says, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given me. In other words, he knew the grace and I want to show you, everybody has grace that is given. It's when you enter that grace that your life changes totally. He says, the grace that is given unto me to you, Lord. All right? How that by revelation, he made known unto me. In other words, the way I entered that grace is that by revelation, God made known unto me what I was to do. As I entered into his said, grace began to manifest. Let me show what revelation. Revelation means an uncovering which of something that is in existence. In other words, if I, if I put this here, and I do this here, and I say, and I just put this here, and you didn't know, I just dropped this here. I say, ah, on my table, there is a glasses case, and, and you just like, you know when I was preaching, was a glasses case, ah, you look at it and say, there's no glass case now. What you see is there's a white what? Cloth. Okay? All right? Now, when a person gets revelation in prayer, it's not like you bring something into existence, it means it is uncovered. So for that person, the person sees. So if you are in a situation and you get revelation, what covers it might be crisis, but God opens it. Do you get what I'm saying here? Somebody will say, yeah, we're in crisis. God has opened it. And the person has seen a case. Once you see the case, you know, faith is no longer, we've well, seen it now. So what you do is you come out of that place with revelation saying there is a case and because it's only you that has seen it, Every other person will be saying it's impossible. What are you talking about? It cannot happen. Because what they are seeing is white cloth. Are you following me? Yeah. But you to you, it's not that your prayer, it's not that your prayer brought that case to exist. Your prayer simply unveiled it. Now, for you to get revelation, the prayer therefore is that God grant unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes of my understanding might be enlightened. In other words, if you open my eyes, I will see it. This is what I'm saying here. Listen, if there's light in this room this way, and I cannot see, let's assume that the person is blind, can't see. You know, if they are blind, they can't see. It doesn't matter whether this light is on or is not on. They'll be tripping over things. You agree with what I'm saying? Okay. Now, it's when the eyes are opened that the light there now counts. You get it? Okay. So Jesus brought light, but they still have to open your eyes so that you will see the word light, or else you won't see it. Do you, are you following what I'm saying here? Yeah. So a Christian can have that closed and they are stumbling and you're wondering what's going on, but there's light, but they are stumbling because their inner eyes has not been what? Open. But if you open my eyes and everywhere is still pitch black, it makes no difference whether I can see or I cannot see. So when Jesus came, he switched on the light, but he says for that light to count, your eyes must be open. Once your eyes are open, you will pass everything. You see, the obstacle is not your problem. You see, when you are hitting it in darkness, you're always going. But when you have light, he says, I will run through the troop. 
Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah? You just go past to show that you have light. People say, how did you overcome? Because they are in darkness and they are hitting on something. They don't know what it is. And they are hitting. And but he says, you will just go past it. So grace is given by revelation. So a person receives revelation of what God wants to do and then they enter into it and grace is there. Now the other guy is struggling with it. So God reveals and it brings forth there. Romans chapter 12 Verse 3 and verse 6, just to show that everybody has their grace. Romans 12. For I say through the grace given unto me. So Paul said, there was a grace given to me. I'm saying this through that grace given. To every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Verse 4. Okay, verse 6. Having then gifts differing, According to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy accord, prophesy according, which means every single person has something that God has given to them. And that grace there. And the point there is to go and receive, all right, and to get to know in this line of what I'm doing to enter into that grace. And when that person enters into grace, you know, this is what I say. When you are tempted to go and do something that God didn't send you, you know when God sent you, you know people will come with vision. This is what I tell people. You can't trouble anybody about vision. You can't. You can't trouble anybody about vision. And I learned this at the beginning of ministry. Since all my years of doing ministry, I've never come to meet anybody to say we are raising offering for something. Because this is what I believe. If you are sent, God will provide. If you are not sent, then don't do it. When you are not sent, you become a burden to people. So I can come now and say, God, God has given us, given us, I didn't get the revelation. No. Now, it is temptation. I've been tempted. You, you get what I'm saying here? I've been enticed of my own, my own house. So I say, this is it. Now, because that thing will bring forth death at the end, what happens is that you now start going to meet people. If you are really a Christian with love, you won't see your brother. You get what I'm saying here? Be in this kind of situation with this dream that I have, with this vision to change the world, with this business. You, are you following what I'm saying? Everybody will have weight on them because God didn't do what? Didn't send you. He said, when I sent you, lacked anything. When he doesn't send you, there'll be trouble on those who are part of your problem. Do you get what I'm saying? You'll just be putting trouble on everybody. All right? Sometimes people put trouble on everybody, and then after some time, they say, eh, well, it worked. You see that work there? Maybe when they were praying, praying, finally they got how the thing should be. So they lifted. But you can put a burden on every single person, on, and it's not fair. If you're a person of integrity, it's not fair. Uh, are you following saying It's not fair. You can't wake up and say that, uh, I want to, uh, I want to, this is the car I want to drive. Like somebody came to meet me once, and he went to this church, he went to borrow money to buy expensive cars. You know? And I was looking at this person. It's not my business. It's actually not my business. If any car you want to borrow money, the only time is you don't call me to bail you out. <laughs> and you are, you are, if you want, you can borrow money and drive. My, if I preach to you and you don't hear the preaching, I, I can't be fighting with you after the preaching. Are you following what I'm saying? <laughs> so you can do anything. So he now started going around. Pastor is not really good. I mean, I, I thought I had a friend in pastor. I, I thought, ah. <laughs> so one day I was talking to Bishop Jupiter. I asked him, he said, have you borrowed money to buy a car? I said, no. He said, then there's nobody. You're under, he said, only if you have borrowed money. Then somebody can say, we can see an example. Do you get what I'm saying here? You can't come up with a project and just say, it will cost 100,000 US dollars. And then you believe God. The person who gave you the vision must also give you the word provision. Now, you can ask, oh, but, and I'll show this, anybody who is not willing and joyfully participating in it as the call of God in their life, leave them alone. You, you, can't, you can't be saying, listen to me, I always thought you were a man of God. <laughs> See, let me show you what I'm saying. Go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I'll close with this. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. All right, from verse 27. 
is a very powerful scripture. All things that are delivered unto me of my father, and no man knoweth the son but the father. Neither knoweth any man the father save the son, and to whomsoever the son will reveal him. Then he says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and you shall find rest in your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now put it in the message translation from 27 there. Look at what he says. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all things to do and say. This is a unique father-son operation coming out of the father and son intimacies and knowledge. So that knowledge is coming from the intimacies that he had with the father. Now look at what he's saying. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. But I am not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to do what? Listen. Look at next verse. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Lazarus, keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and what? Lightly. That's what he said. He said, look, you are, I know that you are tired. He says, you are not inside that unforced. He said, it's grace that you don't have to force. There is, you don't force anybody. You don't force anything. The things just, he says, consider the lilies how they grow. He says, but to get that, you have to get intimate with God, which means spend quality time with God. That you cannot sacrifice. That, look, that's the only way under the sun you can get into that grace. He says, spend quality time, get intimate, and let knowledge begin to come out there. That as you find yourself in a situation, first thing is not God, I'm telling you, get intimate with God there. Worship him, thank him. You've made the provision for me in this situation. And then you praise him and you thank him. That look, this thing has been set up that your glory might be revealed. Now, I want you to unveil to me what you really have prepared in this particular situation here. And then get into a place of prayer and start praying. And then you open the word of God and start reading the word of God. And take, that's why I say, is come out, spend time with me. Make it like a project here to find out what is on God's mind. And once you find out what is on God's mind concerning that situation, you've entered into the grace that God has provided, supernatural help in that particular time there. And as you start doing what he says you should do, you will just begin to experience that power of God within that situation. So let's not let Satan, that's what he's doing, to take us out of this grace. All he's just doing is that he just comes and baits, uh, says uh, somebody else, uh, you to uh, dangle it before you. And then you spend years on that. What, well, that God didn't send you. Then he dangles something else, all right, before you. And then you spend years on that. It's, it's that discipline there to be able to, to pick up what's on the mind of God. Don't spend time there. Care what God is saying to you in that particular situation. And how do you do it? Start thanking him. That's where you start. Start giving him thanks. All right. Uh, before that scripture in verse 20, it says you have hidden these things from the wise and put them the people they think they know, but you have revealed it unto babes and sucklings. For out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have ordained praise. It's a person that goes to God and says, listen, uh, this thing you know, might be totally different from what I'm thinking. So let me just go up to God and first of all, thank him and worship him and spend time with him and then go into prayer there. And then open up the scriptures and begin to read the word of God. And after some time, these things begin to get, all right, clear, all right? And God can lead people and send people into your life, like how Jethro came, all right, into the life of, of Moses and made suggestions, right, to Moses. And your ears are open, you are listening, and, and you, after some time, you connect all the dots together. 
ah, that's what we're supposed to do in this particular situation. And then you get, all right, yourself into it. And you find out that it will be far more than you've ever thought and far more than you've ever in your life imagined. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. This morning, I pray by the power of your spirit that this spirit of wisdom and revelation rests upon this house individually and corporately, upon every single person listening under the sound of my voice, that their inner eyes are opened up to the grace you have provided for them before the foundation of this world concerning their lives and situations in which they are facing in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me. Hear me tap. Hear me tap. Please, during prayer, you can't be moving around this topic. It's not proper. All right, then. Um, announcements um, um, today. Um, big conference ends, Abi. All right, I heard the time is 4.30, Abi. 4.30. Uh-huh. Not 5. 4.30 um, is the last session of big conference. And then, let me announce this. Our final meeting this year is platform. After platform. We are going to rest. Nobody is doing anything. <laughs> Fine now. October 1. After platform, we are resting. October. The soldiers are even doing finishing strong. Yes, we are finishing strong with rest. <laughs> <laughs> when you rest, you'll be strong. <laughs> yeah, you won't believe. Last Sunday, I, you know, I went to preach. So I landed, did this, went, flew to Calgary. I preached, flew back. I couldn't sleep because the meeting in Toronto was, pastor's conference was in the morning and I flew overnight from, you know, Canada is very far. So preached 6.30 and went to the airport 11.30, flew 5 a.m., landed, went to hotel room, prepared for the meeting. When I finished, I was on my bed for, after all the meetings, 15 hours, I didn't leave my bed. I woke up, I said, this bed. <laughs> We will recover all our strength. <laughs> I didn't leave. I didn't go anywhere. I stayed there. Yeah. So we are resting. October, November, December. The only thing you are permitted to do is picnic, <laughs> departmental party, anything that is recreational. Oh, don't let me hear program. <laughs> all right. Okay. On to your back. That will be on the 5th, all right, to the 12th of um, um, January. All right, then I think that. So, oh, sorry. Uh, declarations every morning. Um, so, we'll be doing that's our finishing strong this year. So, we'll be doing 90. No, no, no. We are finishing strong. 90 days of planting, all right. So, we'll be making prophetic declarations throughout the watches into the new year. Now, the reason why we call it planting is that in Luke 17, 6, it says, And the Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to the sycamore tree, Be thou plucked from the roots, all right, and thou, sorry, um, be thou planted into the sea, and it shall obey you. In other words, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, so if you will treat your faith as a seed, then you plant your faith by words that you speak. So you shall say, so it's a seed that you're planting. So we are making declarations and planting those things all right into it. So it's those seeds there that now evolve and produce.